Hi, I'm Christian with IBM. Thanks for joining us for this out-of-the-box experience with IBM's real-time compression for NAS. In the next few minutes, you're going to understand how simple this technology is to deploy in your environment. Let's take a look. We've just arrived in the data center here, um, getting ready to install our IBM real-time compression appliance for NAS. We've opened the box carefully, and we're going to just do a quick inspection of the contents. We have our end-user license agreement, appliance toolkit, rail kit, cable trays, and store-wise compression appliance. So we've just unboxed the compression appliance. I'm going to perform a quick visual inspection to ensure there's no damage. It's a good idea to take a look at the model number and ensure that it matches the expected model number as well as the port configuration in the rear and ensure that matches the expected port configuration. The appliance looks good, so let's take a look at the appliance toolkit. The toolkit contains all the necessary items for installing the appliance. Ethernet cable to connect the management port to the network. Console cable for optional console connectivity. Network cables for connecting the compression appliance to the storage labels in order to clearly label all connectivity, and a marker for labeling. The next item that we're going to look at is the rail kit. The appliance rail kit is designed for ease of installation without tools. However, it's strongly recommended that you use fasteners to secure the appliance to the rack to avoid any inadvertent cable disconnection. The next item we're going to take a look at is the box that contains the power cables and optional cable arms. The box contains the power cords. Always ensure there's two for redundant power connectivity. This box also contains the optional cable arms, which are designed to work in conjunction with the rails, allowing for easy access to the appliance while it's in the rack. Our inventory all checks out. Let's go put it in the rack. We've secured our rails in place. Let's rack the appliance. We've lowered the appliance into the rails, ensuring that it's fastened on each side. I'm going to use the quick release levers to slide the appliance into place and power it up. Now that we've racked the appliance, we're ready to power it up. Now that we've powered on the appliance, we're ready to configure the management interface. The management interface can be configured over a console connection using a standard DB9 console cable. So now that we've connected the management interface to the network, we're ready to configure the appliance through the management GUI. I'll do so using my web browser. I've connected to the default IP address 10.10.0.254 and I'm using the default login and password available in the administration guide. The first step to perform is to confirm that the date and time settings are correct. On my appliance, I see that the date and time settings match the time zone that I'm in and that the time is correct. The next step that we'll perform is to configure the network interfaces that connect the storage to the network. I do so by going to the network screen and creating bonds and bridges. Because the appliance bridges the network sitting between switch and storage, we need to configure the interfaces appropriately. In our target environment, we're using ether channel bonding. I'm going to create two bonds, each one bonding two interfaces. In our target environment, we're using ether channel bonding. I'll create two bonds of type ether channel with the appropriate interfaces chosen. Bond 1 will consist of interfaces ETH0 and ETH1. And bond 2 will consist of interfaces ETH2 and ETH3. Now that my bonds are complete, I'm ready to configure the bridge. I'll do so by adding a new bridge, then selecting that bridge and configuring its IP address details. The IP address of the bridge needs to be in the same network segment as the storage interface that we're connecting to. In my case, I'm choosing 10.10.0.101. Now that our bond and bridge configuration is complete, we're ready to configure the storage. I do so by clicking the storage link. Here, I provide a logical name for the filer, choose the appropriate vendor, 
and enter its IP address. Now that my storage is appropriately configured, I'm ready to start the compression engine and put the appliance in line. I start the compression engine from the network screen, clicking on the Start Engine button. Now that I've configured the management port settings over the console, I'm able to connect that port to the network using a standard Ethernet cable. Now that the console cable is no longer needed, I can unplug it and proceed to connecting to the storage. We're ready to connect the storage to the compression appliance. I'm going to take the first cable, disconnect it from the storage, and connect it to the compression appliance. Then I'll take the second cable, also disconnect that, and plug it into the compression appliance. Okay, now that I've connected the storage to the compression appliance, I'm gonna take two new cables and connect the opposite side of the bridge back to the storage. Now I'll take my cables and connect them from the compression appliance back to the storage. Now that I've installed the real-time compression appliance in front of the storage, I'm going to confirm that I still have access to that storage. I can do so using a standard tool like Ping, or by opening up a map drive. I happen to have a previously mapped drive to this storage, and I can see that I'm still able to access and read the directory and files within those directories. Now that we've completed the configuration and confirmed that we still have access to the storage, we're ready to configure compression and start compressing data. Compression is configured through the compression filter screen. Here, I'm able to choose a specific SIF share and configure it for compression. I choose the appropriate share in the dropdown accept the changes, note the pop-up that indicates only new files will be compressed, and accept. It's that simple. Now we're ready to write some data compressed. Now that we've enabled compression, we're ready to start optimizing our data. I'm going to return to my previously mapped drive and copy some files, optimizing them as they're written. As we can see, I'm still able to access the data as I did before, and all the optimization is completely transparent to the end user. As we see in the status screen, we're getting a solid 80% reduction on our data. Typical compression ratios vary anywhere from 50 to 80%. The compression ratio of your data may vary. So there you go. It's that simple. If you have any questions or you just want more information, please check out our website below. Thanks for watching.